Okay, welcome to my talk on benign prosthetic hyperplasia, in short, BPH. As the name suggests, benign prosthetic hyperplasia is due to a benign uh, hyperplasia of the cells and tissues of the prostate gland. BPH is a common disease in men above 50 years of age. It is due to an enlargement of the prostate gland which causes obstruction of the urine outflow from the bladder, therefore causing problems in voiding and storage. It's due to hormonal imbalance that occur in men of this age. Before we proceed on with the lecture proper, let's look at the uh, refresher on the anatomy of the lower urogenital tract, eh? as shown in this diagram here. Okay. Basically, it consists of, uh, on the left side here, it consists of these various structures that are associated with the urinary system. Eh? Among them will be your bladder, your external urethral sphincter, which is here, okay, external urethral sphincter, and your urethra. Okay? The urethra itself is uh, divided into four main parts. One is the, the part that passes through the neck of the bladder. The prostatic urethra passes through the prostate and receives the ejectatory ducts from the uh, vas deferens and seminal vesicles. And also the part that passes through the spinter, that's the membranous urethra. And then the major part of it is your penile urethra. Okay. Whereas on the right here, these are the, the structures that are involved in the genital system. Yeah. This first group of them will be the seminal vesicles, with the ejectatory ducts, the prostate gland and the corpus gland. The second group of uh, structures will be the testis, epididymis and the vas deferens, which carry the sperms from the, the testes to be secreted into the prosthetic uh, urethra. Okay, this slide shows you an outline of the, summarizes the outline of this urogenital system, which is basically consists of a bladder, bladder neck, prostate, urethra and the very important structure that is contained in this region of the lower end of the prosthetic urethra. Then the other structures are mentioned in this group here. Okay, now let's look at a closer view of this lower end of the prosthetic urethra, urethra, urethra to see what is there. Okay, this is the prosthetic urethra here that end the lower end okay this is there is a prominent or uh, eminence in this area which is known as the verum mentanum which is located uh, site of uh, openings of the ejaculatory ducts and the prosthetic utricle then you have your sphincter at the lower end in the it is also verum mentanum also is a landmark for the sphincter, external urethral sphincter. Okay, the verum mentarum is a rounded eminence on the floor of the posterior urethra, which marks the boundary between the membranous and prosthetic urethra. The prosthetic utricle and ejaculatory ducts are empty their contents into this area of the prosthetic urethra. During endoscopic resection of the prostate, TURP, the, this verumentarum is the landmark uh, of the external sphincter and therefore is the lower limit of resection of the prostate in TURP. Okay, this slide shows you the cross section of the prosthetic ure urethra, the prostate. Okay, it consists of three lobes, two lateral lobes, and a middle lobe. The middle lobe is subdivided into an anterior uh, part, the, and the posterior part, 
and a middle part. Okay, and this the is the mid median middle part is the one that surrounds the urethra, and this is the median lobe. The anterior, posterior, and median lobes are immediately around the urethra. The posterior is the part from which 70% of adenocarcinoma arise, whereas the median lobe is the site of origin of the majority of benign prostate hypertrophy. Uh, this diagram shows you functionally the various zones in which the prostate is decided. It's got a central zone here, a transi uh, peripheral zone and a transi transitional zone. Again, it is important the transitional cell is the site of origin of BPH, whereas the posterior zone is the site of origin of the majority of prostatic cancers. Okay. This is a diagram to show you this is the normal prostatic gland. Okay. We need the bladder neck. Okay. And here, the, this is the normal size. On the other hand here, the prostate here, you can see it is enlarged. Here is one side. Here, both the lobes are enlarged. Okay. This causes a narrowing of the urethral passage here. Narrowing of the urethral passage which gives rise to obstructive symptoms. And if it is large enough, it also extends into the bladder neck region and the trigo. Now let's see, look at the pathology of the benign prostatic hyperplasia. Okay, okay. This diagram shows you the prostate gland transverse section. The glands, prostatic glands, are uh, arranged in three tier glands. Eh? The innermost is around the urethra, known as the urethral glands. The middle group of prosthetic glands, known as the submucous glands. Okay, uh, and this submucous gland is the site for the origin of BPH. Then the outer one is the outer zone. Huh? This is the peripheral glands, okay, peripheral prostatic glands, which gives is the site where the cancer of the prostate originates. Okay. So you have your submucous gland, urethral gland, and the uh, prostatic glands proper. They are arranged from inner to outer in three tiers. Now, the origin, as I said, starts in the of BPH starts in the transitional zone. As it extends into the peripheral zone, it causes compression and enlargement of the uh, lateral lobes to form the lateral lobes of the prostate. And, and thus, the hypertrophy of the glands involves into the uh, uh, central zone will also extend into the base of the bladder here. Okay, So it originates from the submucous glands in the transitional zone, compresses the peripheral zone into forming the lateral lobes, prominent lateral lobes, and the middle lobe can extend into extend into the base of the bladder and sometimes if it occurs in both sides this uh, enlarged prostate can involve the neck of the bladder like a intravesical prostatic collar you know it, it uh, enlarges around the prostatic uh, urethra or the bladder neck region here Now we come to the pathophysiology of BPH. As you all know, the prostate is a male reproductive organ which produces the prostatic fluid which nourishes the semen. The exact mechanism of benign prostatic hyperplasia is uncertain. However, it is clear that androgens play a vital role in the development of prostate during the adolescence and the future development of BPH. Unlike other androgen-dependent organs in the body, the prostate differs in two ways. Firstly, the prostate converts testosterone to dihydrotestosterone or DHT using the enzyme 5-alpha reductase present in the prostate. 
DHT is five times more potent and accounts for 90% of androgens in the body. This is the uh, pathway for the conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone. Eh? Activated by the enzyme 5-alpha reductase, which is present in the prostate. So, testosterone from the circulations is acted on by 5-alpha reductase in the prostate and there, therefore converting it to 5-DHT, which is present in the prostate in high concentration. The second difference is that the prostate retains the ability to respond to testosterone and thus the levels of DHT also remain high in the prostate throughout life. The benign prostatic hyperplasia occurs in men who are 50 years of age. By 60 years old, 50% of men have histological evidence of BPH. BPH is a cause of significant lower urinary tract symptoms in men, okay, the so-called LUTs. In men over 70 years of age, the most common cause of bladder outlet obstruction is BPH. As for the etiology of the BPH, it is believed to be due to hormonal imbalance. The imbalance in the testosterone, DHT, androgenic and estrogenic steroids. DHT remains in the prostate and is locally active in prostate for a much longer period than other tissues. And this has got direct relationship to the uh, genesis of BPH. Testosterone levels slowly decrease with age and with this, the estrogenic steroids remain the same. Therefore, there is a relative increase in estrogenic effects. And BPH may occur when these hormone changes somehow trigger the growth of the prostate cells. Okay, so you see testosterone decreases with age Estrogens remains normal, so there's a relative increase in estrogens which causes, triggers the prosthetic cell growth, leading to BPH. Now, next we come to the clinical presentation of the BPH, which is very important to take a very good and detailed history from these patients. And these symptoms in these patients and, and signs are related to two groups of uh, uh, situations. One is related to lower urinary tract symptoms and the other one is bladder outlet obstruction symptoms. Eh? So most of the symptoms and signs in these patients are related to either lutes or boo. Okay, the first group of symptoms uh, patients will be with no symptoms asymptomatic patients eh? in among these the first group consists of no bladder outlet obstruction and it is negative eh? boo is negative the second group of patients without symptoms is the patients who are there's urodynamic uh, evidence of bladder outlet obstruction boo is positive okay so the two groups first group boo negative second group boo positive then the other group of patients with symptoms, okay, the first group is urinary tract obstruction symptoms or LUTs positive, whereas bladder outlet obstruction, boo symptoms are negative. So boo is uh, LUTs positive, boo negative. The fourth group of patients with symptoms will be LUTs positive and boo negative, okay. And the other miscellaneous group of patients are those with acute or chronic urine retention, hematuria, urine infection, and stone formation. These are these two are due to the retention of urine and stasis. Now, what are the lower urinary tract symptoms includes in patients? There are two groups of them. One is related to voiding problems, 
So there's hesitancy, poor flow, intermittent stream, dribbling, sensation of poor emptying of bladder, and episodes of near acute retention of urine. The second group of symptoms will be due to the storage problems of the urine. Eh? And this is due to frequency, nocturia, and urgency of micturition. The other group of patients will have various forms of incontinence, which are, can be either due to urge incontinence, overflow incontinence, or nocturnal uh, incontinence, also known as anuresis. Okay, so that was the Lutz symptoms. Now, the Boo symptoms, what are the bladder outer obstruction symptoms? Okay, bladder outer obstruction is due to a blockage at the base of the bladder by an enlarging prostate or some other cause. It reduces or stops the flow of urine into the urethra from the bladder. Okay, the symptoms of BOO include abdominal pain, continuous feeling of a full bladder, frequent urination, pain during micturition or dysuria, problem starting urination, which is known as urinary hesitancy, slow, uneven urine flow, at times being unable to urinate, straining to urinate, and effects of urinary tract infection. Okay, this table here is the International Prostate Symptom Score uh, Question A, okay, IPSS. This is uh, symptoms in patients with regard to seven of these parameters incomplete emptying, frequency, intermittency, urgency, weak stream, straining, and nocturia. So all these parameters are assessed from, uh, for the patient's experience in the last one month. Okay. Decanter severity and frequency. A score of zero is given to patient who do not have any of these symptoms. And a maximum score of 5 is given when it is frequent, always present, and severe. Okay, so these patients are scored according to the severity of the symptoms. And the total score for this will be uh, maximum score is 35. So a total score of 0 to 7 is mildly symptomatic, 8 to 19 moderately symptomatic, and more than 20, eh? 20 to 20, 35 is severely symptomatic. So in this patient, you add up the score here that you gave, it is 7. So it is mildly symptomatic patient. Okay, so prosthetic uh, symptom score uh, helps to give some objective measurement of the patient's symptoms. Apart from that, the IPSS score of uh, classification, there's also another factor that can be taken into consult, uh, uh, account, that is the quality of life due to the urinary symptoms. Okay, that's uh, this one. In this, you ask the patient, if you were to spend the rest of the life with your urinary conditions the way it is now, how would you feel about that? So, a score is given between 0 and 6. Okay, zero is when he is delighted. Okay, he is quite happy with his symptoms, and it's uh, six is when he is feels miserable, uh, terrible uh, symptoms. His life becomes miserable, and three is mixed. So zero, one, two, considered favorable, and you may not just need to uh, observe the patient and put him on surveillance for progress. No definite. Uh, Treatment huh, is necessary. There is score four, five, and six. Some form of treatment has to be given to these patients, okay? Because the patients are uh, deeply distressed or deeply disturbed by these symptoms, his life is affected. So this may be a very subjective form of uh, uh, assessment, 
but this is the most relevant to the patient. The need for treatment, how much the symptoms affect his daily life. Now we come to the examination of patients of BPH. The first is abdominal examination in BPH. Although it is usually normal, but sometimes patients with chronic re, uh, urinary retention, a tender, a non-tender distended bladder may be palpable in the suprapubic region. So this has to be carefully looked for. Acute retention is usually quite easily detected because the patient will be in severe pain. Patient may have a groin hernia, which aggravates this uh, urinary symptoms due to straining. Then the all important DRE, eh, digital rectal examination, is a very important exam part of the clinical examination. Okay, in a in, in a patient uh, PPH patient, the posterior surface of the prostate feel smooth, convex, firm or rubbery and symmetrical. The median groove is and lateral grooves are uh, felt, clearly felt. The rectal mucosa over the prostate is mobile and the residual urine may be felt as a fluctuating swelling above the prostate, pushing the prostate down. This may be a difficult uh, sign to elicit in most patients. Then the examination of the neurological system is of utmost importance because the neurological problems can give rise to mimic the prosthetic obstruction. These include diabetes mellitus, tabis dorsalis, disseminated sclerosis, cervical spondylosis, Parkinson's disease, coda equipment lesions, and particular importance is spinal trauma and other neurological disorders. Okay, what are the differential diagnoses of bladder outlet obstruction? Uh, boo. Okay, these are the common causes of bladder outlet obstruction. The first five here are the more common ones, benign BPH, prostate cancer, bladder calculus, bladder cancer, and urethrocyte. Others include bladder neck stenosis, bladder neck hypertrophy, urinary tract infection, such as and prostatitis, and neuropathic causes, uh, functional obstruction. And the common, important com and common differential diagnosis for BPH would be prostatic cancer. Patients may of, or often present with lutes. And on examination, DRE, the prostate is asymmetrical, craggy, hard, nodular, and the raised prostatic specific antigen are indicative of prostatic cancer. This is a very important sign. Eh? Then there may be evidence of UTI and usually this is associated with dysuria, loin or suprapubic pain and fever. The third uh, differential is overactive bladder uh, syndrome. Okay, In these patients, the bladder is overactive and the patient may have a will have symptoms of lutes and ultrasound scan or post void scan will show a low post void residual volume. Bladder cancer must not be forgotten. In patients with bladder cancer, they may have lutes symptoms, but the prominent feature will be hematuria. Painless hematuria will be the predominant feature. Okay, next we come to investigations for BPH. Okay, urine analysis is a very important initial examination, especially looking for evidence of bacterial in, uh, infection. Okay, by urea plus 
culture and sensitivity must be done for these patients. Blood test includes a full renal function test which include serum creatinine, blood urea and serum electrolytes. The other blood examination is serum estimation of serum prostate specific antigen or PSA which will give us an idea as to the risk of cancer in the patient. Okay. PSA is usually uh, normal uh, but can be raised in patients with benign prosthetic hypertrophy. Okay, the normal value of PSA is less than 4 nanograms per mil. Next, we come to the imaging met, uh, uh, techniques, which include a plain X-ray abdomen, or KUB, ultrasound scan of the abdomen, and a transrectal ultrasound scan, which is becoming increasingly more useful these days. Then you have a cystourethroscopy uh, examination of the urethra and cyst, uh, bladder to exclude urethral strictures, bladder tumor, and non-opaque bladder stone. And finally, you have these so-called urodynamic studies, which I will go into a bit more detail in the next few slides. And having said this, all the various investigation. I must emphasize on the importance of digital rectal examination of the prostate gland. Okay, the detection of a heart nodule or multiple nodules with obliterated uh, prosthetic groove and immobile rectal mucosa are highly suggestive of cancer of the prostate. Okay, the investigations will again ultrasound scan, abdomen and transrectal. The usefulness, uh, the ultrasound scan is used to calculate the volume of the prostate, okay, which is measured by the uh, width times height times length of the prostate. Okay, and normally it is 4 by 3 by 2 centimeters. And, uh, Prostate volume of more than 30 ml is considered enlarged. Ultrasound also uh, is used to assess the rest of the renal tract, especially upper renal tract for hydronephrosis. It is also a tool, good uh, effective tool to measure the post-void bladder scan okay, or the post-void uh, residual urine scan okay which will give an indication of the import, uh, significance of chronic retention okay they will detect chronic retention of urine urodynamic studies the can give objective measurement related reported symptoms in the patient this include bladder contractility flow rate and storage capacity. Huh? The two methods, uh, two methods of study will be the flowmetry study and the systometry study. Systometry, yeah? Okay. The other one is also, it can be used to measure, the other thing is to measure the bladder outlet obstruction index or BOO index, huh? which will detect obstructive voiding related to, B, related to BPH. It's calculated by using the maximum flow rate and the detrusor pressure at maximum flow rate, huh? PDT, pressure of the detrusor. Okay, the formula used will be BOO index is equal to the maximum pressure of the detrusor pressure or the voiding pressure minus two times the maximum flow rate. Okay. And if the BOO index is more than 40, then it is obstructed. Okay. If BOO index is 20 to 40, it is equivocal. Eh? Not sure. Eh? May or may not be significant. And a BOO index of less will be unobstructed. So normal in individuals will have a BOO index of less than 20. Okay. Now I'll go into 
a bit about the Eurodynamic studies, which I mentioned. Eurodynamic study is used two things, eh? systometry and flowmetry. In the flowmetry, what we do is you have a special container which has got sensors uh, and these can be connected to a recording machine. So the patient urinates into this uh, container which detects the, the speed, maximum flow rate of the urine stream. Okay, And it is done women by you sitting in a uh, toilet bowl and a man in urinating into the container this is the container here okay so this is the patient urinating into the container which is got uh, attached to sensors and then it is relayed connected to a uh, recording machine here which records the flow rate Okay, nowadays, this, this uh, can be connected to sophisticated equipment which can give you very accurate readings of uh, as far as this systemetry and flowmetry are concerned. Okay, this one, the bladder systemetry gives you the bladder pressure and the volume, especially residual volume. And the urometry gives you the flow rate, maximum or peak flow rate. Okay, these are this is diagrams to show you the study, the machine, the graphic uh, results which can be printed to be interpreted. The patient it sits on the machine, sits on a chair, and urinates into the container, which is then uh, traced or recorded. The readings are recorded in the machine here. This the diagram here shows you a post void residual volume on PVR measurement. The patient is uh, asked to go and pass urine, empty his bladder, and immediately the bladder is scanned, ultrasound scan, to measure the residual volume. In normal individuals, it should be less than uh, 50 mL. Okay, and in older patients, it can be it can be between 50 to 100 mL. Eurodynamic study, the concept is based on the combination of low flow rate in the presence of high volume, voiding pressure. Okay, high voiding pressure, low flow rate. There are two common uh, components of the study. One is the Euroflowmetry, which measures the flow rate of the urine, which is uh, represented by Q. And a systometry is, a press, is the measurement of the voiding pressure in the bladder and the volume of residual urine. Okay, voiding pressure or the detrusive pressure. So I've given you the, uh, the formula. The Boo index can be calculated by the voiding pressure or the detrusive pressure, maximum pressure, minus twice the maximal flow rate. And I already mentioned, normally it should be less than 20 Boo index. More than 40 is obstructed. Okay, now some normal values eh, of urine, urine flow rates. For a voided volume of 200 ml, the peak flow rate of more than 15 ml per second is normal. Peak flow rate of 10 to 15 is equivalent, equivocal, and a peak flow rate of less than 10 ml per second is low. As for the pressures, the voiding pressure increase. Okay, the pressures more than 80 centimeters are considered high. Pressure between 60 to 80 centimeters of water equivocal, and pressure less than 60 to uh, 60 centimeters of water is normal. So a normal patient should have a pressure less than 60 centimeters of water and a peak flow rate of more than 15 mL per second. In a patient with BPH with outlet obstruction, the pressure is high, it should have high pressure, and the volume and the peak flow rate should be, will be low. Okay, so normal sinuses, if the high, high voiding pressure, the flow rate should also increase. But in BPH, the pressure of voiding pressure is high, but the flow, peak flow rate is low.
Okay, now we come to the complications of bladder outlet obstruction or BOO as illustrated in BPH. Okay, this diagram here, this is a normal prostate and a normal lumen of the prostatic urethra. Here, there's prostatic enlargement in BPH causing narrowing of the prostatic urethra. Okay, the complications related to this obstruction of this uh, prosthetic urethra and the bladder neck, which can be either acute due to complete obstruction or chronic due to incomplete obstruction. Acute obstruction is normally precipitated by uh, factors that cause diuresis, such as drugs or alcohol intake. It can also be precipitated by re prolonged recumbency, eh? patient lying down for too long due to illness or after an operation. In chronic retention, the bladder, due to incomplete obstruction, the obstruction is chronic and the bladder decompensates where the muscle becomes weaker. Weaker detrusal muscle contraction and the residual volume becomes more than 250 mils. What are the long-term effects of BPH and bladder neck obstruction? Okay, what happens? The prostatic urethra becomes lengthened and narrowed due to the obstruction. As a result, the posterior curve of the urethra becomes exaggerated. Because of these changes, the bladder wall becomes hypertrophy and trabeculated, and between trabeculations develop uh, dilatations known as seculations and large secules uh, join together or enlarge to form bladder diverticulum and bladder diverticulum can contain the, uh, give the site to the formation of stones from within and because of these changes that take place there's more residual urine in the bladder which is prone to infection increased blood flow and gauge veins at the base of the urinary bladder causes hematuria, okay, which is the late sign in uh, BPH. Secondary bilateral hydronephrosis and renal failure can develop, and very important, abdominal wall hernias and hemorrhoids uh, can develop in these patients due to prominence, uh, due to straining at maturation. Next, we come to the treatment of BPH, which consists of three parts. First, watchful waiting in patients who do not need surgery or treatment. Then, second is medical treatment. And third, surgery. Okay, you can generally you can use the International Prostatic Symptom Score, IPSS, to assess the severity of symptoms to decide on the type of treatment that you want to give for this patient. Okay, next we come to the treatment of BPH. Huh? Absolute indications for treatment will be severe obstruction, urinary obstruction, acute uh, severe obstruction, acute urinary retention, sign of upper uh, urinary involvement, okay, hydronephrosis, urinary tract dilatation, and renal failure in related insufficiency. Okay, for this you must have some form of treatment, either medical or surgical. The relative indications for treatment will be moderate symptoms of prostatism. You can assess it using the IPSS, recurrent urinary tract infection, hematuria, and just now we mentioned was the quality of life issues huh? in accordance with the IP, IPSS. I told you, if the patient's life is uh, affected, quality of life, then you may have to start him in some form of treatment. Okay, first, medical treatment. Two groups of drugs are used. First is the alpha adrenergic blockers, okay, which uh, help to flex the muscles surrounding the uh, prosthetic urethra. As a result, there is dilatation of the uh, obstruction to flow is decreased. The second group of drugs will be 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. Okay, And uh, the drugs make the prostate shrink by 25% when taken for a year. 
So the treatment is long term. If you taken for short term, it will not be very effective. Okay, especially the alpha reductase inhibitors must be taken for a long time. Now the alpha adrenergic blockers inhibit the soothe muscle contraction around the urethra, prostatic urethra, and common uh, drugs that are used: doxazosine, terazosine, tamsulosine and alfuzosine. And the, and the common or important side effects of this drug will be postural hypotension, dizziness and fatigue. Now, the other group of drugs will be 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. As I mentioned earlier, this 5-alpha reductase is the enzyme that converts testosterone to the active form D Hydro, dihydro, uh, dihydroxy testosterone eh? and some of these drugs will be like Prosca, Finasteride or Dutasteride. Side effects decrease libido, decrease uh, sexual function or erectile dysfunction, decrease volume of ejaculation and gynecomastia and tenderness. At times some patients may need to combine treatment eh? alpha blocker with alpha reductase inhibitor so in these patients of course the side effects will be also increased now the operative treatment what are the indication what are the operations indication for uh, surgery eh? acute retention of urine Chronic retention of urine, renal impairment, residual urine more than 200 ml, secondary hydrouretus or hydronephrosis, okay, evidence of impaired renal function, raised blood urea, creatinine, bladder, you know, presence of bladder stone, infection and diverticulum, which need uh, treatment, patient with uh, immaturia. Elective prostatectomy in our patients, in 60% of the patients, is most common cause for the is prostatectomy is combination of severe symptoms with a low flow rate of less than 12 ml per second. Okay? This is the uh, most common indication for surgery in our patient for 60% of our patients. Okay. So the surgical procedure is known as prostatectomy, eh? excision of the prostate. And the most commonly used method these days will be the transurethral method, eh? which is known as transurethral resection of the prostate, TURP. Okay? It's a gold standard and is a minimally invasive procedure. And this has become the most important treatment for BPH. The second one is the open prostatectomy. There are three types, retropubic or Millins prostatectomy, which is suitable for large uh, prostates, transversical prostatectomy, and perineal prostatectomy, which is obsolete nowadays, not many uses. Eh? Okay. The types of open prostatectomy, one, transurethral here to the urethra. Secondly, retropubic. And then thirdly, transversal through the bladder, and lastly, transperineal, which is, as I say, not done. Okay, so this will be your open prostatectomy, which is now less done, very much less than compared to transurethral. The third group of them is laparoscopic prostatectomy. Okay, this is also a minimally invasive surgery, and uh, this is usually done for carcinoma of the prostate, not so much for uh benign benign prostate hyperplasia okay it's more for carcinoma okay now we come to the transurethral resection of prostate turpm okay so what happens is now this is the bladder so strips of tissue are cut from the bladder neck down to the level of the verum and tarnum using high frequency diatomy current which is applied using a loop mounted on a handheld 
trigger the sector scope. Okay, I'll show you the pictures in a short while. Okay, so strips of chips or strips of tissue excise through the receptor pass into the urethra. Okay, right until the verum antarum. Okay, you must be careful identify the verum antarum so that you will not resect further down, further distal to that, which may injure the or also damage the external splinter leading to incontinence. It offers accurate coagulation of the bleeding points. Okay, and I said verumentanum is the distal limit of resection, and the chips of prostate are removed using the elite evacuator. Okay. Now let's have a look at the instruments that I use. Huh? Okay, this is a resector scope that is introduced to the penile urethra and uh, to reach the prosthetic urethra here. From there, using the diatomy loop attached to the tip, then the diatomy uh, uh, prostate is scraped off using the diatomy. And usually we use bipolar diatomy. Yeah? And uh, these are the various types and shapes of loops that is available. And in this process, you use a lot of fluid. Huh? You run in fluid through this uh, channel here to give you a clear vision and once it is done, it is, this is again drained into the, 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 the fluid is drained out to the elite evacuator, which is shown here. Okay, so this is the elite evacuator, which is attached to the receptoscope here. Okay, this diagram shows you the enlarged prostate before TORP. This TORP is being done to scrape off the prostate. And this is the surgery after a prostate. Must be, must remember, the TURP does not remove the prostate entirely. Okay, it is only part of the prostate that is removed, which causing obstruction. Okay, now complications of TURP. You have local complications and general complications. Local complications will be bleeding primary and secondary, catheter blockage by blood clots, perforation of the prostate capsule leading to bladder or rectum injury, infection, damage to sphincter causing urinary incontinence, retrograde ejaculation, impotence, urethral stricture, bladder neck contracture, and the last one is recurrence, okay, reoperation for recurrence. As I said, the prostate is not totally removed, so whatever is left behind can grow up, grow back, and recur. So it's found that after eight years after TRP, the incidence after TRP, eh, the incidence of recurrence which needing pre-operation is 15 to 20 percent. Whereas after open prostatectomy, it is much less, eh, 5 percent recurrence. Next, we have the systemic or general complications of TORP. Okay? It can cause pulmonary edema, sorry, atelectasis, pneumonia, myocardial infarction. You must understand these patients are very elderly patients, so all these problems can occur. And uh, specific symptoms, uh, syndrome is known as the uh, specific complication uh, of importance is TORP syndrome or water intoxication. Okay? Because you are using water to to uh, flush and irrigate the uh, operatic field, absorption of water can go into a circulation to cause CCF, hyponatremia, hemolysis, mental confusion, and even infarct, cerebral infarct. Nowadays, with the use of isotonic glycine as the irrigating fluid, with isotonic saline post-operative irrigation, the compl this complication of TRP syndrome is very much decreased. Now, what are the other in minimally invasive treatment that is available for uh, BPH? This, there are numerous of them, and most of them are still under clinical trial stage. First is the transurethral incision of the prostate, or TUIP, the laser treatment, which is becoming increasingly more popular, used to cut or destroy the prosthetic tissue 
and there are a few types of them green uh, laser green light laser holmium laser thulium laser then you have the transurethral microwave therapy or tumt transurethral needle ablation tuna less uh, popular are uh, high intensity ultrasonic uh, energy therapy clinical stage prosthetic stents implanted devices such as procedures known as euro lift these where implants are uh, implanted into the prostate to relieve the obstruction and prosthetic artery embolization which is performed by the radiologist okay this technique yet to be established as a standard practice Okay. In summary, I've covered the anatomy, physiology, and pathogenesis of PPH in relation to bladder neck, sphincters, and prostatic urethra, the history and physical findings, voiding and storage, lutes and boo, and the IPSS. I also highlighted the importance of direct digital rectal examination and the features to suggest it is benign and cancer. I went through the simple investigations that were commonly done, urine analysis, blood test, PSC assessment, ultrasound, abdominal and transrectal, cystourethroscopy and urodynamics. Eh? The treatment, medical and surgical, medical alpha blockers, alpha reductase, inhibitors, surgical is TORP, the most common, open RP, retropubic and transcycle, and local methods, which I listed a large number of them. And also touched on the local and systemic complications of prostatectomy. Okay, thank you for your patience. To see you again in another similar session soon. Thank you.